it's actually a piece of um, transformational alchemy because what we have on the dollar bill are symbols for those who have eyes to see. Okay. And if you can if you can decode the dollar bill, then you move on to the next stage of consciousness. It wasn't evil when it started. It's just you look over the last hundred years where we went off course with the monetary policy. Now everything is so dark. Lucas, come here, Lucas. The new people that had parents who were, you know, abusive mentally to their child. There's increasing interest in secret societies and symbols because of books like Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons. Today, Simon Cox, best-selling author of Cracking the Da Vinci Code, joins us. His new book is Decoding the Lost Symbol. He's going to shed light on some things you may not know about America's founders and history and the dollar bill. And later in the show, Mary Ficka Laura, author of Choosing Honor and American Woman's Search for God, Family, and Country in an Age of Corruption, joins us. And then filmmaker Anne-Sophie Dutrois, an 18-year-old who wrote, directed, and starred in the feature film Faded Memories. But first up, Simon Cox. Great to have you here today, Simon. Yeah. So while I know these Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons books, and your books have been selling like hotcakes, there are millions of them out there, how good of a job does Dan Brown do? Does he get it right in this one, or what's fact and what's fiction? And he does a so-so job. He does a so-so job in all of the books, really. Yeah. Um, but he does kind of... You know, he has this, this title page where he says, this is fact, and he lists the things that are fact within mm. his book. And uh, then does he also say, this is BS? No, he doesn't. <laughs> that's the trouble. That's what you're here for. Quite. And many of the facts are actually not factual at all. So that, mm. that's the problem. That's where he trips up, is that he claims certain things are facts, and they're simply not. So that's where I come in. Well, yeah, and since you mentioned, you know, these, a lot of publishers and people have been bitten by people writing things and claiming to be, I mean, in this case, do you think it matters if it's more fictionalization or, you know, or is it a big deal that he's not being up? It can be a big deal yeah. to a lot of people, especially people in, uh, in my genre. I'm, I'm part of the alternate history genre, if you like, so, mm -hmm. and, and that's the genre that he plows through to find his, you know, background material for his books, and uh, yeah, we get a bit sort of knocked if he doesn't get it right, so um, um, I'm here to put him straight. Well, as I said at the top, you know, I think there is a lot of um, interest these days because, you know, you hear these things about the Freemasons and stuff. And in fact, I told you, I just got back from Italy and while I was walking around Rome, I was thinking about the Da Vinci Code and some of the and angels and demons and, you know, the, what's going on here with it, some of the, the Egyptian obelisks and all the symbols and things. But I just want to, as you do in the book, I mean, you kind of go through various topics and I want you to kind of just take us through some of those. For instance, actually starting with the dollar bill. Indeed, um, dollar this, is, this is really interesting. Yeah area of uh, discussion because this is a piece of alchemy right here. People take this out of their pockets every day. They buy half a coffee with it now instead of a whole coffee. But, um, <laughs> Don't even try to get a euro with it. <laughs> right, right. Um, and it's, it's actually a piece of um, transformational alchemy because what we have on the dollar bill are symbols for those who have eyes to see. Hmm. And if you, can, if you can decode the dollar bill, then uh, the, the idea behind it, but the people who actually implemented some of these symbols is that you move on to the next stage of consciousness, as it were. So um, we've got the, the, the Great Seal of the United States on the dollar bill, and, and it's the first time that people really saw the reverse of the Great Seal, hmm. which has this pyramid. The pyramid with the eye over it. The eye of the pyramid, which is a... Uh, uh, an image that um, is supposedly a Masonic image, but it's not a Masonic image at all. The Masons actually appropriated this image much later. This is an Egyptian image. It goes all the way back to ancient Egypt. And uh, that's, that's my area of study. I'm, I'm an Egyptologist by, uh, by trade, I suppose. But you've got all sorts of number symbolism on here. You've got 13 all over the place. Um, so now, some people think of 13, 13 as an unlucky number, or of course the 13 colonies. But so it's what, what, supposedly what the 13 original colonies, but it also relates maybe to the, the 13 um, people at the Last Supper, oh. and various other um, symbolic elements within the number 13. It certainly doesn't seem to be clear cut that it's just the 13 colonies, because we find 13 symbolism repeated again and again and again. Hmm. Um, but one of, the more, one of the more strange elements of the, of the dollar bill is something that even conspiracy theorists miss, and that is in the, in the shield on, on the front, the top right hand shield with the one in it, there's a little sort of indentation in the shield in the top left. Yeah. And uh, it has a little tiny squiggle in there. And if you blow that up and blow that up and blow that up, it looks like an owl. Yeah, I was trying to show that to somebody. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's right here, right? It's is that right okay? Here, right because what some people say it's an imperfection in the print, but it does kind of look like. Well, when you blow it up, it, oh it? yes, when you blow it up to, to enormous proportions, it does certainly look like an owl. And um, of course, it, it kind of relates to. Um, uh, the new book, Lost Symbol, because uh, the, the chief bad guy in there is called Moloch, uh, or Malak, and um, 
this this owl is supposedly a representation of Moloch, the biblical Moloch, who becomes this symbolic head of the so-called Illuminati, which um, is featured in Angel and Demons. We have this circular kind of uh, element all of uh, brown stuff. He, he chooses the same subjects time and time and time again. So, so the dollar bill, really important piece of. Uh, so, alchemy. but are you saying that's a symbol of the bad guys then, or something? Or yeah, what do you think? That, of, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I'm pretty ambivalent towards it, quite honestly. I, you know, it may well be an imperfection. Um, however, it's it's interesting, and many of the other symbols, um, you know, some of the Latin phrases, for instance, and uh, some of the geometry of the dollar bill itself is 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 quite. Symbolic and it's quite um, interesting. Now, I think in the, the book or the movie or whatever it's going I know it will be a movie at some point. Yeah. <laughs> you know that. Um, they, write, they draw the word Mason, probably? Yeah, they do. And, and quite frankly, that's modern bunkum. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so that, that's, that's the no, BS stuff. It is. Yeah, um, absolutely. And what about you know, the pyramid we're going to come back to later in another segment? But what you, tell me about the pyramid in the eye. What does that mean? Well, we have here a, a very interesting uh, concept. And that concept um, is, and I think Manly P. Hall, um, the great esotericist uh, who was here in LA in the 1920s and 30s, um, came up with the idea that um, America would never be um, the, the full a burgeoning nation that it can be until the capstone is lowered onto the Great Pyramid. Because the Great Pyramid in, in Giza in Egypt has no capstone. Mm. And this seems to be echoed in this because you have a truncated pyramid with no capstone, and the capstone is hovering above with this eye in the capstone. So this very idea seems to be echoed within this. And I find that quite an intriguing and interesting set of, you know, because this is, this is put on a dollar bill. People get this out every single day. And 99.9% .9 of people who have one of these don't understand or see the Absolutely. relevance. Well, and you go into some of the history of how that ended up there. Um, can you tell us kind of briefly Very interesting cast of characters involved in this. You, you know, it was 1935, and uh, Henry Wallace, who's the, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, I believe, at the time, he goes on to become the 33rd Vice President, and he's a 33-degree Mason. So you've got, again, strange symbolism around the people involved in this. And you've got um, FDR. Uh, he was also a 33rd degree Mason at the time. Oh, so and he was a Mason, okay. They, they implement this dollar bill. Um, but Wallace is himself, he is influenced by people like Nicholas Rorick, who's this incredible character, esotericist, and Manly P. Hall, and uh, Helena Blavatsky, who's the uh, theosophist. So you've got all of these um, interesting elements in this. You've got some really intriguing characters, a cast of characters that you couldn't make up. It's like a movie. It's quite something. The people that bring about the symbols on the dollar bill. Now, what do you make of the Freemasons? Because, you know, again, these, the secret societies in these movies usually come across as, well, the bad guy, let's face it. And so, you know, between conspiracy theorists or, you know, some people say it's anti-Christian or even maybe satanic, but other people, I think the Masons themselves or others say that they're actually embracing all religions and not one. Um, Anyway, what's your take on the Freemasons? I mean, I mean, personally, I'm pretty, again, I'm pretty ambivalent towards the Freemasons. Seems to do a pretty good job in, in society nowadays. They, they are, um, you know, I don't, I certainly don't think they're out to rule the world in uh, in that conspiratorial way. I think, you know, it's the secret societies we don't really know about the important ones. They're the ones we should worry about. Uh, we all know Such as, know, well, if we don't, oh, well, we don't know, know about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, but yeah, by the very nature, of secret society is secret, mm -hmm. and we're not meant to know what they're doing. Um, but you get you get three guys in a room together, and there's a group. They, they form the gang, a society, a group. So we shouldn't be surprised that we have these things going on. Um, but the Freemasons, I think Dan Brown treats them um, um, pretty fairly in, in the Lost Symbol. He doesn't use them as the bad guys in that book at all. Really, uh, he's he's pretty good towards them. And. But many of the founders of our country, though, were Freemasons. Or quite uh, a few. I mean, George Washington. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of the, of the signers of the Declaration um, of Independence. Some people think that as many as three quarters of them were actually Freemasons at the time of the signing. So it does seem, that, and there are certain Freemasonic principles embedded within the founding of this nation as well. So yes, the Freemasons play an incredibly important part here. All right. Well, thank you very much, Simon Cox. The book is The Lost Symbol. We'll be right back. And we are back. Joining me now is Mary Ficalora. Her book is Choosing Honor, an American Woman's Search for God, Family, and Country in an Age of Corruption. Great to have you here today, Mary. And I have to say, right from the start, since we were just talking about the pyramid on the dollar bill, I see some symbols here on the cover of your book, the pyramid, or the eye in the pyramid, and the rose. Can you tell me what your, the book cover is about and how kind of a nice coincidence that it ties into the last segment? It definitely pulls in the symbols of who we're supposed to be in this nation. and. That's where I'm going with it, and we're not exactly who we're supposed to be. We're in very 
And then people go, what are you talking about? But um, we're, we're, living we're, in, an age we're in tough times. Yeah, we're in very tough times. And we do have a very serious choice to make. Are we going to do the right thing? Or are we going to do the easy thing? And the easy thing is to just carry on and whatever happens, happens. And usually that means war, I'm sorry to say. Um, or we can be who we're supposed to be. And if you start looking at who we're supposed to do, be, I love synchronicity. The last symbol tells us well, and your other ghosts, your other ghosts, uh, guest Simon Cox also let us know. There's Freemasonry in our foundation, and what does that mean? Well, freedom, free, building freedom. That's our national political religion, which is another thing that got me going. When we talk about Judeo-Christian, oh, I, nothing against the Judeo-Christians, but no, that's not America. No, you've, freedom. you've studied Freemasonry or some aspect of it. Or no, Freemasonry. Or say esoteric studies, Manley yes. P. Hall, also right. Simon which, Cox. Exactly. I spent years studying at the Philosophical Research which, Society. Which he founded. Yes, yeah. which he founded. And um, The Secrets of All Ages, which is in the front page of The Lost Symbol. Um, it took me a long time to plow through that book, but I've read every page because it's so fascinating. And then raised Roman Catholic, and I mean, really Roman Catholic. Mom brought priests home to talk about things at the dinner table. So um, I grew up with questions, a lot of questions. So, so what, is, what is wrong with America? You talk about things like the money power and things like that. What, what's derailed us or what, you know, is that? Well, I call it a mind game, it, and it is a mind game. Um, and is there evil in the game? Yes. Can you beat that evil? No. You can just harmonize it. Because it wasn't evil when it started. It's just you look over the last hundred years where we went off course with the monetary policy. And that monetary policy was accepted, even though it was wrong, because it does increase our standard of living. But now, OK, so you're critical of, again, the money power of the monetary system, but yet you don't seem to be anti-capitalism, per se, or you think? Depends what you're talking about capitalism. Okay. Are you talking about a centralized bank that controls all the issuance, or are you talking about capitalism where the people have the power to issue the money, and there is no government oversight, can't have government control, because it's based on a commodity that they have no control over. Well, There's a difference. OK, and you also talk about the fact that well, you think that like advertising and advertisers are focused on getting us to be a, like a culture of consumers and that sort of thing where it's all focused like on... Preying on our ignorance. So as the Buddha says, ignorance is the greatest evil on earth. We have to wake up to owning our own ignorance and being constantly paying attention, which is the running theme and choosing on paying attention. One of the main teachings that you'll find out as you learn about God and you go deeper than what the religions are telling us is God's will. Well, what is that? Pay attention. Well, I'm wondering... Not that God wants us to. That's what it is, anyway. Well, no, I'm sorry. It's just, you know, there's so many ways to go with this. Yeah, but, okay. but with the current, you mentioned the monetary system okay. and the central banks. Considering the disaster we just went through, any... I mean, I guess that's just confirmation from your point of view that something's yeah, wrong? Or? I, I got heart sick when they bailed it out. I was uh, yeah. frantic because really, I see this part in this time in their history as a crossroads. And... Um, what has been wrong, we have the opportunity to set it right if we act, if we pay attention to it, really know what it is and don't let them continue the wrong. So what, what is it that we need to do? Or what, are we, what should we do? How do we get past this? How do we right the wrong? Let's we need to decentralize it and return to what the basic founding fathers had set for us in our documents. What I do in the third part of this book, Country, is return to, I take the whole Masonic revelations that I show, and I, it's, I don't call it Masonic, I go to the ancient mysteries, which the Masons also pull from. And there's a steps to power, I call them the absolutes, because I was playing off of some of the Christian people call them absolutes. And I say, well, wait a minute, these are the absolutes. If you want to take it, this is where all religions take it from. And I took those 10 steps to power, and I applied them to our Declaration of Independence and, um, and our Constitution. And lo and behold, all 10 steps are in those documents. And the scary part is a vast majority of them we no longer honor. Can you give us some examples of well, um, how our military works. Okay, the way it was set up was to avoid any kind of possibility of tyranny, um, because uh, one of the absolutes is to love all, love 
all. That's our step to power. When you love all, you do become more powerful because you reap what you sow and all of those back and forth. Okay, the, our founding fathers didn't put in love all, but they did put in steps to keep us from having a tyrannical dictator take over. Thus, military was well, decentralized. We didn't, have a, army we didn't have a standing army. We had a decentralized force. We had community militias. And if there was going to be any war, then every little community had to vote yes, and then they had the state would have to go to the Congress and, did, and, and, and include their military in the war. So war was not an easy thing to get into. Well, over the last hundred years, that sure has changed. And it's directly parallel to when our money state changed. And we need to wake up to this because all of the reasons for it are no longer valid. And so what are some other things that, you know, above and beyond the military? Because you mentioned the 10 things that you think are... Well, um, I mean, as far as the steps to power, what's, yeah. what's the most important thing? Yeah. The realization that every word we say, every thought we have, every feeling we have actually has power and that when we bring it together with other people on the same thought process, same page, it, it increases that power. So what we're doing, what we pay attention to is so essential and we have to pay attention to the mind game of our, what's being manipulated. When you look at all the healthcare noise and you look at all the, uh, the homosexual um, mixed marriage noise and it, it's a diversion that's thrown at us when what really all of it could be set right if we got our money back <laughs> get our power back because as I say in the book it's our magic wand and really literally when you look at our bill as your earlier yeah. guest was showing we just deconstructed it yes it's our magic wand that is a talisman for making our reality come into being. That is what the power is all about. And that's why in our constitution, the power of issuance was the people's, not the government's. Uh, and we lost that when the Federal Reserve came into being. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry we're out of time. But choosing honor, Mary Ficka Laura, an American woman's search for God, family, and country in an age of corruption. We'll be right back with Anna Sophia Dutrois. a time when life was simple, a time before the voices began. Now everything is so dark. Lucas, come here, Lucas! Lucas, when are you coming to save me? And we are back. Joining me now is Anna Sophie Dutrois. She's an 18 year old woman who just produced her first movie, directed, starred in, wrote, Faded Memories. But you did this when you were 16, you started, you're 18 now. Yeah. I'm impressed, and it was good. Thank That's you. the thing. It wasn't, you know, at first when they sent me this and they said it's a young filmmaker, I told myself I want to see it first. But it was good. I mean, it's slick. You did a good job with it. So how did this come about as, as a 16-year-old? Well, honestly, since I was a kid, I was always writing plays. I was just putting my friends in them and things like that. So mm -hmm. I always had this passion really young. I mean, how young were we talking? Um, I think my first film, I, I was about seven. Seven, okay. Yeah, I just took my dad's <laughs> camera. And I was just like filming around, and I, I still have it. I still watch it sometimes. Oh, well, oh. yeah. Is it on YouTube or something? Or, uh, uh, no, <laughs> it's not. It's a home video. Oh, no, okay. Stuff. okay gotcha. But uh, then I went to New York Film Academy. I was about 15 years old, and oh. that's when I told my parents, you know, that's what I want to do. I didn't know it was a job, but when I learned that it was just actually it was fun. Yeah, I was just watching movies, and I didn't even think about you know people directing like what it took to make a movie. I just thought you'd just see it. So um, when I was 15, I went to New York Film Academy. It was on the back lot at Universal. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So that was amazing. Um, I just got just to hanging out at Universal. Huh? Yeah, just like on the back lot. It was just amazing. But didn't Steven Spielberg had to sneak into Universal? I think right initially, yeah. but you didn't have to sneak in. You were just based there, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was just there, and I did my first short film, Marked, and it won prizes around, and I even went to Wales and uh, oh. England, oh. and I got a prize there, so I just said, that's my career, that's what I want to do, and so then I send like, that short film around to some private investors, so I had to network a lot. And I made it happen, and I found money. Yeah, because, I mean, I, if you don't want to tell me, you don't have to. I won't pin you down. But um, 
But it looks like it costs, I mean, it must have cost some money to make this film. It was quite expensive. I mean, it, you're talking about a few like, million or something? Or like I don't know. a million you know, range. Mm -hmm, okay. Yeah. And now, so what did you shoot it on, too? Was it high def? Um, it was a Sony 900R. Okay. It is a pretty good camera. We ha actually had two cameras. Is that what they call the red camera now these days? Or yeah. Is that okay, okay. Yeah, it is. I've been hearing a lot about that, so. Yeah. It's a good camera. And, yeah, and how, okay, I forget the length, because I know it's a full, okay, 88 minutes, that's a full length feature. Yeah. And so, and you had a fairly big cast, actually, oh, too. Oh, yeah, we, we shot it in 20 days. 20 days. Oh, yeah, it was a rush, I remember. It was just so fun. I barely slept, but I didn't, I wasn't even tired. It was just so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, so writing, starring it, directing it. Yeah. Now, when did you actually shoot it? Because you wrote it when you were six? Um, I wrote it at 14. 14, OK. I, and then I shot it when I was 16. 16. Yeah. And then like post-production and, and all that, how long did they putting it together, post editing, all that? Production was about six, seven months. Okay. That, that's a long part of it, the process. And then the premiere was last November. Wow. Oh, and now at you're Universal. Oh, are you know, oh, yeah. oh, not bad. And um, now are you taking like to the festival route and that sort of thing? Um, or? Actually, for this one, we're just selling it, it oh. on Amazon.com. People oh. can buy it here and then on Amazon.com or the point .ca for the Canadian market. Oh. And it had a limited release also last year in LA, so. And I'm wondering, I mean, this movie had some pretty serious adult themes in it in a lot of ways. I mean, it was not, um, you know, with adoption and abuse and various things. Yeah. For somebody that young, where did this come from? I mean, was it partly based on your life in any way, or was it just things you observed? I or? It was mostly a lot of things that I observed. You know, that girl is very she has a dark side to her. There's also a light side. So I guess everybody has both of the sides. You just have to explore them. And for the issues about abduction and such, um, I always did a lot of research. I was also involved in causes. So yeah. that's how I kind of got that information. And also knew people that had parents who were, you know, abusive mentally to their child. Mm -hmm. And I got to talk to these people and just foster care kids. And that's how I kind of got that side because my life, my family <laughs> life is not like that at all. You've never been in an insane asylum, you ever killed anybody. No. Or, just check in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but on the other hand, there is also sort of like a Cinderella theme to this as well, though. I mean, there's yeah. kind of the dark side, but then there is, without yeah, giving away too much, there there's is. There's a lot at the end. Well, so what, what is next after this? I mean, I really think she's somebody to watch. I think you're going you're gonna to do something out there with your films. So. Well, after this, I'm planning on shooting my next movie, Blue Winter. And uh, that's kind of a, the same kind of movie, but it's a little bit different. And um, I'm just hoping to shoot it um, end of next year or beginning of the this year. Well, send me well. a copy when you've done it. Now, the cast in this movie, though, I do want to mention, um, for instance, the, your romantic. Wait, tell me, tell me about who's in the the leads um, were in this in here. Romantic lead. Um, there's uh, Brock, hmm. Brock Kelly, and um, there was also Ellie Puget and um, Kim Morgan Green. And, and how did you find them or get them on board? Um, basically, we had a casting director. And that's, I was like at a, every um, session and I was just looking over the, who we would cast. And so it was a casting director that mm. brought them. Now you did cast yourself in the, the, yeah. the lead. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that was an easy decision, huh? Yeah, I actually, when I was writing it, I, I was planning on doing it, so. Do you have no interest in acting or directing? Or, I mean, would you prefer to be, be in front of the camera, behind the camera, both? Honestly, or? that's why I do the three things, because that's basically what I like to do. I couldn't really pick anything, but definitely directing is like a big thing for me. Mm. But I also like to act. And now, again, the actors, as I say, there was a fairly big cast. Um, are these, I mean, how much were these people unknown or unknown? I mean, do you, um, you know? Actually, some were in um, TV shows. Mm -hmm. um, one was in ER, so they're, they had- Who was in ER? Um, the lady that's playing the nurse. Okay, um, that makes her sense. Her name is uh, Connie. Uh, she was there, and then also the romantically, he was in like some soap operas. Okay. And um, the Ellie Puget and um, Kim Morgan Green, they were in tele televisions and some films, so. And I just wondered how hard it is, to, I mean, to get the, I guess, of course, everybody wants to be in a film, I don't know, so I guess you got that working for you, but, uh, well, I'm impressed. I mean, a tight shooting schedule, and in some ways, a, a tight budget for what it is, for a 90-minute um, yeah. film. Yeah. And, uh, uh, let's see, and your mother was played by, or the uh, adopted mother, you know what I'm trying to say, you're not, 
Um, they have, I guess, actually. Oh, my uh, aunt? Yeah. Or, well, at the end of the movie, we actually see. Um, oh, that's right, because you had your real mother, well, adopted. They adopted. It's kind of complicated. I don't want to give away too much. But yeah, there was, uh, there, yeah, I was the one that was playing my aunt. I did, okay. That I was living with in the movie. And we lived in a trailer. And did you have fun doing those scenes? Because on I mean, the one hand, I mean, they're kind of intense, but yeah. Um, it, it was fun, actually. I really like dramatic scenes, and my favorite ones to shoot were actually the ones where I was in the Azilium. And I was being crazy because you actually were in a real Azilium. Like, it was actually haunted. Oh. Oh, yeah. So you were telling me, I mean, did you see stuff or experience um, things? We, or? Well, there was like <laughs> this myth, it was kind of like a rumor that on the fourth floor, there was um, this doctor and he was a ghost and he was there. So one of the actors actually went up there and filmed some stuff. So, it, and you could really feel like some vibes there. It was really creepy. And one time we stayed till like three in the morning and it got like really creepy. That could be your next film, or your film after the next film, <laughs> The Ghost Adventures or something. Well, thank you very much. Anna thank Sophie you. Dutrois, the film is Faded Memories on Amazon and yep. a Canadian site. Yeah, Amazon.com <laughs> or Amazon.ca. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.